to get started in Luke chapter 12, right at the beginning, I'll not read the whole chapter, but we will read it as we go through it. Luke chapter 12, I'm, I'm dealing with the idea of more value. Um, you know, the importance to him that, that we truly are. In this passage, you'll find we're more value than many sparrows, and that's just one of the topics. But Luke chapter 12 as a whole, he's dealing with times of trouble, times of tribulation, times of suffering, and how God would like us to manage those things. Um, as you look there in Luke chapter 12, and beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So here we see an innumerable multitude of people. So many, they're trotting one upon another. They're, they're, they're falling over each other, gathered into one place in order that, in order that they would, would throng Jesus, to hear from Jesus, to, to get something from Jesus. Most of them, we find, were there for, for whatever perk the Lord had, whatever gift that the Lord had, whatever healing or miracle or sign that the Lord had. They're gathered there to get something, I believe a lot of them, selfish from Jesus. And amidst all of that, Jesus sees this innumerable multitude so that you can't even count them. And it says, he began to say unto his disciples first of all. So right off the bat, we see that his focus is on his disciples. His disciples are those that are following the Savior. If you continue in my word, then are you to my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you're not continuing in the Lord's word today, don't call yourself a disciple. It's easy. It's plain. It's, it's clear. Disciples are the ones that are after the Lord. They're, they're seeking after God. You can be saved and not be a disciple is what the Bible, I believe, reveals to us. And we know that there's people that actually show greater works sometimes than, than even disciples would. And that's the group referred to that next. And that's the hypocrites. Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He deals directly with his disciples giving them care and giving them oversight amongst the multitude. And the first thing he wants to deal with is to watch out for the religious hypocrites. Watch out for those people that say something and do another. Say they are something and do another. Market themselves as one thing and then, in fact, their works completely deny that. They say YouTube is not church and, and, and then do later that we're going to live stream only and call it church. They say... Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. This is my favorite because I've heard this thundered from the pulpits. Bring your tithes to the storehouse. Bring your money to the church. Bring it to the building. And now these same, they fall over themselves to say, oh, oh, PayPal and send your money and send, send your cash and send all those types of things. We'll give you another way to pay because we're closing up the storehouse. Religious hypocrisy. Beware of it. Those ones that say, I would never close up on some government regulation. But then... When the government even deems the church essential, they shut the doors anyways. It's a religious, religious hypocrisy. Beware of it, disciples. If you're in your word today, hey, beware of the leaven. Beware of that little bit of leaven that will leaven the whole lump of your Christian walk. Beware. Be aware of it. Now, there's no need to fight against this all the time. I mean, I've done most of my fighting right here in the pulpit, okay? I put it up and I broadcast it. I fight to the people that are here. I'm, I try to make the people that come to church that I believe are disciples of the Lord, that I believe are following after him and seeking after him, I try to make them aware, even as Jesus here is making them aware of these things. But he doesn't call the disciples to arms after these hypocrites, after these Pharisees. No, he just wants you to have this in your consciousness. Be aware of these things. Because that leaven of hypocrisy that is coming across the YouTube pulpits of America and Canada, it is going to mess you up in your own Christian walk. Be aware of this. Verse 2 says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness, that shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. It will be revealed the actual heart of the matter. When, when the times start rolling on, all of these preachers that have said, oh, it's just two weeks, so it's okay. 
All these preachers have said, oh, well, they're not picking on all of the, uh, just the Christians. It's all the taverns and the other things that are closing down the sports events too. The hypocrisy of the statements that are being made that three weeks ago, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, they wouldn't, they would have contradicted their own self. That hypocrisy will come to pass. So we need not to constantly be fighting against it. Now, the truth is, and what you're going to see is that in the last times, I don't believe that the majority of deaths, especially to Christians, is going to be as a result of a plague. I mean, the Bible's pretty clear that it says, A thousand shall fall at thy right hand, it shall not come nigh thee. The, the promise is made that it shall not even enter in your health. The death angel in Egypt passed over, and those that were covered with the blood were protected from the death of the firstborn. Amen. I believe that the majority of the deaths will be a result of these religious hypocrites. Whether it's by their actual hand coming to the blade, or whether it's by them turning over folks, you know, by by getting the confessional and then blackmail, right? We saw that in the Dark Ages a lot, among the Catholic Church especially, but there, there's new ways of, of getting people's information, having them confess secret things to you and then turning them over to the authorities when the time is convenient and opportune. There's also the old idea of the FEMA pastor who's been taught, who's been trained up in the manner of how to take Romans chapter 13 and which teaches obey the higher authorities and there's no higher authority than that of God and the powers that be are ordained or ordered of God and giving their proper place right but they'll take that and just say obey all authorities obey every rule of government obey everybody that you are subject unto right so don't fear the manner of it, and that's ultimately the challenge that God has put forth there. He says, beware of these hypocrites, but don't fear them. Nothing is covered that shall not be revealed. There's nothing that was spoken in darkness that shall not come to the light and be heard there. In verse 4 it says, and I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them. Don't be afraid of these. And who's it referring to when it talks about them? I connected that directly with Pharisees in the context. Be not afraid of them. It's not even the government that's the real problem. It's the religious folks, apparently, with the scriptures. Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you of whom ye shall fear. Fear him which, after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And that goes for the believers as well. Now, we won't be cast into hell. I believe we can be cast through a hell on earth while we experience life and what's left of it. I believe in the last days we're either going to have God's providential protection on our lives, or we're going to do great exploits, or we're going to have misery shared with and coupled with the world. Constant strife and turmoil and suffering and pain and anguish will come that those that are fearing the world above God. If you fear God, fear Him that can kill and send to hell, then you're putting everything in its proper place and in its proper order. Disregard the religious. Don't worry about the religious that are trying to turn you in, trying to hand you over, trying to be that FEMA pastor to have you march through, march through the lines to get your shots or whatever, right? Don't worry about those. Don't fear them. Fear God above all things. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise knowledge. Fear Him. And the best thing about fearing God is that He cares for you. So when you put proper reverence and respect and fear directed towards him, he's not going to abuse that. He's not going to take advantage of you just because you have chosen above all things to give your fear and regard unto him. He's not going to take advantage of you. He's not going to hurt you as a result of it. He may allow for you to suffer, but in the end, he's going to have his way. He's going to make sure that you come out on top of any scenario that you're put behind. You won't be tempted above that which you're able Verse 6, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. You are of more value. This, this speaks to God's attentiveness in your life. God even sees the sparrows, it records, fall to the earth and die. 
they're not forgotten before God. They're not misplaced. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, it's not like the old adage, you know, if a sparrow falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, did it make a sound? God knows. He's attentive to these things. And above all of those sparrows that fall for circumstantial reasons, you are special. His attention is upon you. You are a peculiar treasure unto the God of heaven. Why not give your fear to him and just trust him to carry you through any scenario that the world throws at you? Verse 8, it says, And I say unto you, whatsoever, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And so this isn't that you'll be denied and cast out if you are brought to a point where you have to confess the Lord is your Savior and you don't, and so, so you're stricken down and then you die and go to hell forever. No, this is actually, I believe, just speaking to God's care and protection and provision over those that would, would boldly name the name of Christ in these last days. Preaching his word, reading his word, taking the name of Jesus with you, preaching it to people in the streets, going to church, being in the congregation of the believers, doing all the things that we've been supposed to be doing for the past how many years you've been saved, doing all of them proudly before men. The Bible says, confess is to deny not. So if you're not denying Christ, you are confessing Christ. If you are not denying Christ's works, you are confessing Christ's works and doing what he expects of you. This speaks to God's care, protection, and provision, I said, because if you confess him, you will see, receive more attention from the ministering spirits that God has for you. He says, if you shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels in heaven. In other words, he won't deny you before the ministering angels, the ones that are watching over you. The ones that we saw in, in the book of uh, Kings, where, where the servant could not see the forest for the trees, and he saw the enemy until the veil was lifted from his eyes, and suddenly he beholds, and there's a great innumerable amount of angels there watching over and protecting him and the prophet. We have access to those because if we confess our Father, or if we confess His Son and deny Him not, He will do the same before the angels of God, and they will be there to minister unto you and to help you in these times. Verse 10 says, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. It goes on in another place to say, In this life nor the next. Now, that's a sign of a reprobate there. It's an indication of a, of a lack of need to even confess the Savior before a person like that who would, who would blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Now, regardless, I believe this needs to be spiritually led because people do say a lot of really dumb things at times. People will speak against the Son of Man and we can't necessarily tell whether they're blaspheming him or the Holy Ghost or what's really in their heart at that time. But if we're led of the Spirit, then we can trust that, hey, you don't need to confess before the man that would blaspheme the Holy Ghost. It's, 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 it's useless. It's wasting your time. And I think that level of discernment is going to need to be more appropriate in these last days because God's going to show us who is receptive and ready to be saved, who that needs the Son of Man be confessed before them, and who that we should probably just avoid because there's someone that's going to sell you out, throw you out, you know, throw you to the lion's den, someone that's going to try to destroy your life if they hear you confess him before men. We're going to have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in the last days. We're going to have to be smart about how we do things. The church may end up going underground. The church may end up being a secret gathering again like it was in the Old Testament. Invite only. Sorry, we're not opening the doors and saying everybody's invited and waving a rainbow flag out there. Invite only is what the church was in the last days because there was a certain amount of, of discernment that was needed amongst the believers because they didn't want people that are blaspheming the Holy Ghost and therefore unforgivable entering into the congregation. Some of those, I believe that points way back to the beginning of this chapter when we talked about who? The Pharisees and their leaven, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is also going to be a mark of those that have denied, blasphemed the Holy Ghost and shall not be forgiven in this life or the next. Now that being said, if we read again in verse 11, it says, And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what ye what thing ye shall answer, or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye shall say. And we talked about this last week when we talked about the great 
opportunity of testimony that is awaiting those that are his disciples in the last days, that are following the word, that are doing what Christ wills. There's going to be great opportunity for somebody that normally doesn't have much of an audience, somebody that normally may be shy, to stand before a magistrate and proclaim Christ and do great works and great exploits. More of that in the other sermon. Verse 13, we'll continue on. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Now, Christ puts value in us. He says ye are of more value than the sparrows. I believe that should be reciprocal. We should put more value in Christ than in the sparrows, than in the things of this earth. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this earth will go strangely dim. They'll go rightly dim because Christ needs to be all in all and above all in our lives. And this man comes to him. He says, hey, Lord, would you have my brother give me more of the inheritance? Divide it with me. He comes with covetousness. I believe this is another thing we're going to see in these last days. Read on in verse 14. It says, and he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. So your life is of more value than the things that you own, the things that you possess. And I believe in the last days, though sometimes we think to ourselves, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, you've went to somebody and you are giving them the gospel. I know we usually use lying or, or like murder as example, but have you ever said covetousness? De desiring something that isn't yours. A lot of people are like, whoa, is that even a sin? Is that even a sin to look at my neighbor's, you know, Lamborghini and desire that? Is that, how would that even be a sin? I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not harming anybody. But covetousness is actually one of those sins that'll get somebody thrown out of church because it's something that festers and just like a little leaven, will leaven at the whole lump where suddenly everybody's covetousness. And the problem that we're going to face is while we don't think it's a sin now, just wait until the grocery stores start getting a little bit lean. Wait till the lineups start getting a little bit longer. And then suddenly that covetousness turns into hatred for your brother, turns into murder of your brother because you're trying to get what is theirs. Because now it's not just a matter of wanting to order up your life and have a nicer car. It's a matter of wanting to have bread versus having no bread. And covetousness will make a man murder, I believe, in these last days. And so we need to be on guard of that. Take heed and beware of covetousness in your heart and in your brethren's heart. Again, we're just taking heed and we're just being aware of this. We're not trying to fight people um, at, proactively in regards to having covetousness. But again, it is something that if it isn't found in your heart and verifiable and it's an issue and it's becoming a problem, it will have you cast out of church. Because that is not something, especially in these days, that needs to be running rampant in the house of God. Covetousness. Now, if you continue on to verse 16, it says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, so this man, he's, he's, he's got a big barn full of things, and now he's going to take advantage of the fact that he's got more. I'm going to waste these barns and knock them down just so I can build greater. Now i got so much that I'm, I'm, I'm retired, I'm going to relax, I'm going to chill. I have no need of anything. And the, the, the story here that you can see is that this man had essentially given his whole life to this. Covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And so in that context, it's covetousness that this man was suffering for. And covetousness left him in a position where he thought he had need of nothing. And when you have need of nothing, you have no need of the Lord above all things. And so you are putting your faith not in the Lord. You're putting your faith in the things which you have. And you can see how this can be a major problem. Verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And what's the wealth of, what's the, what's the value of a soul? Well, I would say unto you, it's, it's, it's of more value than many sparrows. It's of more value than, than even your life that you have, especially the possessions that you're holding these days. 
And yet he sold it all for the things that he wanted to possess because of covetousness. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And that's the conclusion of the whole matter. And this can even apply to Christians. Why? Because for to be carnally minded is death. If you are carnally minded in this life, it will cause you death and decay. Not the second death. You're not going to hell. But you're going to face death in this life that is, that is painful and, and hurtful and harmful. Especially if your covetousness gets you kicked out of church. A lot of people by choice are removing themselves from the house of God these days. But how much the more when you desire to be there and God removes you because of this wicked heart of covetousness that's entered into you. Your life is not things. Your life is not food. It's not clothing. It's not anything temporal. Your life is hid with Christ and God. Your life is eternal. It's in the heavens. And that's what we need to be seeking after. Look at verse 22. It says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, and again, I love how it reminds us that he's still speaking to his disciples. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body more than raiment. Add to this, take no thought for your life, you know, how you will hide yourself from the germs. Take no thought for your life, how you will clean everything enough. Take no thought for your life of these things that honestly shall take thought for themselves. I heard it spoken to me by, my, by a pastor that I know, and he's been telling me that he's telling his kids, hey, look what they're trying to do. They're trying to flatten the curve, lessen the curve. And you know what he told his kids? He says, you're going to get sick. They're not trying to eliminate the curve. He said, you're going to get sick. It may not be this year. It may not be next year. It may not be COVID-19. Maybe it's going to be COVID-20. Who knows? He's like, but God doesn't promise you protection from getting ill, Okay. And he tells his kids about the three times in his life where he remembers being six years old and looking at his mom with such a harsh fever that lasted days in the vomiting. A six-year-old that lost 20 pounds of body weight when he was sick. And he actually asked his mother, Mom, where are you going to bury me when I die? And he remembers this, and he goes back to this, and he said he experienced a similar thing when he was older. He's like, kids, I can't promise you that you're going to have a life that is free of illness. We can't separate ourselves enough so that we will never catch a bug or a germ that could knock us down and knock us out. But what we need to realize about the whole weight and truth of the matter is, take no thought for it. Live your life today. In the same way that you can walk out of this building and get hit by a car that jumps off the curb, it's the same issue that we have always faced. And it's not new. It's called death. Passed on from Adam, your great, 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 granddaddy. Death is everywhere. And the numbers are skyrocketing because there's more people around to die. <laughs> Go figure. Death has dominion over this life. And the only way that you can escape that is to believe in the Son, Jesus Christ. After that, you're sealed. Everyone wants good news. What's the next step? What, well, where's, the, where's the silver lining in all of this that's going on? If you're born again, it's heaven. I'm not going to promise everybody in here that things are going to just get better. We're going to get to June, and suddenly we're all going to be like on spring break again. We're going to be enjoying the beaches, and everything's going to be hunky-dory and wonderful. I'd be foolish to promise you such things. Things might get worse and worse and worse. Just as the people of this world are waxing worse and worse and worse. Don't expect to recover from this. Don't expect to go back to your beloved 9 to 5. Don't expect to go back to your old life. But take no thought for it. Who cares? Who gives a rip? You're dying and going to heaven. Honestly, if you are, then that is the silver lining. The things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. Verse 22, I was there. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat for your body. Why? Because God's taken thought for those things. The life is more than me. The body is more than Raymond. He's going to bring some examples here for us to consider. Verse 24, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Well, the Bible tells us you're of much value, much greater value than them to him. 
And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? In other words, by planning, by preparation, by thinking on these things, by meditating, by, by scheming. How can you grow one cubit? You cannot. God's in control of this life. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, well, I mean, imagine that growing a cubit is a least thing. Why take ye thought for the rest? That tells me that this whole life is very complicated. And God arranging all these things is a task. It's something that you can't take thought for and plan and manipulate and control. And yet the world makes a chart and they say, okay, we got to flatten this curve by planning and taking thought for these things and having everybody in their own domain and then spreading them out and then we can flatten the curve. We don't need God. It's like a new Tower of Babel. It's, it's, it's us. Let us make ourselves a name. Let's us make a tower. Let's us plan to how to flatten this curve. Take no thought for these things. This is all really complicated. Leave it to God. Do you not think that if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face... Do you not think that God will flatten that curve to nothing for the sake of his people? Do we not believe that scripture? He will heal the land. That was the promise that was made, right? Do we also not think that if his people rather choose to follow the logic and wisdom of this world and hide themselves in a cave, then God can take that curve and skyrocket and destroy everybody? God's in control of these things and it's really complicated. And only an omnipotent God is able to care for these things. If ye not be able to do that thing which is least, which, mm, I'm going to grow a cubit. And how do you expect to put food on your table without the Lord? Amen. Verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like unto these. Solomon, the richest, most wealthy, most prepared, most loved, most, most encouraged, peaceful king that had everything he could possibly need, wasn't even arrayed like a lily in God's mind. Verse 28, if then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, ye little of faith. And that's an indictment to all of us. If we're not believing God to just put clothes on our back, you're of little faith. If we're not believing God to put food on our table, you're of little faith. And the thing that I like about actually all these distractions being removed is now I go out and I go for walks and it's quiet and there's not a lot going on. And I can do things like what the Bible says. Imagine that in 2020 with all the distractions we had a month ago. Now we can consider the ravens. Now we can consider the lilies. Now we can go to the ant now, sluggard. Now we can look at God's creation and learn something. We can go into God's word and learn something. It's good to be distraction free. I wonder if this wasn't in God's plan. Consider, as we have less distractions, hopefully, because some of us have taken one distraction and just piled it on with another, right? Part of what I believe is the reason for cutting off sports and cutting off entertainment and cutting off the movies and all that is because they want people watching the stupid news. They want people to just have that on all the time, just pumping into their heads, pumping into their hearts, filling them with fear. And, and Christians are doing that. Would you believe it? Turn that junk off. you got everything you need right here. Everything you need in here. You want to know what the end result and the end game of COVID-19 is? It's not in a curve. It's here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Letters, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Plagues, Ephesians, Philippians, Revelation. Verse 29. Seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful mind. And that's what it is. When you're out without faith, you are just doubting. Verse 30, For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Isn't that true? And your Father knoweth you have need of things. So with all that God is orchestrating, He knows what you need. Okay, so, so why do I spend my time dwelling on trying to get what I need when 
my God knows. And God has promised, I am of more value than the lilies. I am more value than the ravens. I have more value than the sparrows and everything. Even more value than the multitude. Go believe that too. See all those people out there that are afraid? It looks good on them. They should be afraid. They're going to face, face the devil's hell when this is all over. Whether the COVID gets them or whether they get hit by a car, hell is waiting for them. Maybe they'll fear and learn to fear the right God. Maybe they'll fear and repent of whatever else they were trusting. Maybe they'll lose it all and then finally come to the saving knowledge of Christ. But for us, what do we need to fear? We are of more value than even that multitude that is scared of there. God so loved the world, he gave his son. Okay, what is he going to give and provide for his children? Okay, that, that have already believed on Christ and entered into that covenant. Have faith, Christians. Don't doubt. The Father knows your needs. Instead of seeking after these things and behaving just like the world, seek the Lord. Verse 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. In another place it says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Verse 32, fear not little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I love that. His desire is that you would inherit everything. Everything that he gave to Christ as the head, as the King of Kings, Lord of love, everything that belongs to Christ, he wants us to inherit it. And so instead of gathering after what the world has and seeking after those things to provide for ourselves a lifestyle, verse 33 says this, sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in heavens that faileth not, where no thief approach, neither do neither moth corrupteth for where your treasure is there will your heart be also and so not only are we trying are we supposed to not accumulate things and hoard stuff away god says hey take what you got and sell it so that you can give to another so that you can support another and that is going to yield heavenly riches something that will never corrupt something that will never wax old something that will never rust and that's a wonderful thing when you think about it. Don't go hoarding like the world does. Don't be thinking about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on, how you're going to stay safe, how you're going to do this and that, and planning everything about your life. But rather just give up, give away, sell it, get rid of it all. Be on a bare minimum, and then you will have lack of nothing. Why? Because God provides for you, gives you resources to give more of yourself, and all the while, all you're doing is accumulating wealth where it actually is important, and that's in heaven. Sell that you have. Think about that. I mean, we have an abundance of junk, do we not? Stuff that we don't use, but somebody else could probably use. Okay, so, so what is wrong with selling it off and giving with it? Now, what is off, wrong with helping somebody out with it? I believe that it's not only not wrong, it's actually very much right to give and to be of that giving spirit, especially in these last days. Imagine like the people that hoard stuff and yet have nothing to give and nothing to offer, no way of accumulating anything lasting as far as value goes. Some of these people that have hoarded are now trying to return it because they've made themselves broke over hoarding all this junk. Okay? I believe it's just a principle. Hey, don't worry about the things that you have need of. You've already got an abundance, so much so that if you were to sell it off, it wouldn't matter one iota. Verse 35 says this, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What's he saying? Be ready to go and on fire. Be girded about, be dressed, be ready, be, be ready for the next thing. Be, be prepared for what God has for you and your lights burning. What does that mean? Well, that means that you're not in your PJs. That means that you're not hiding your fire, your light, your gospel, hiding, hiding the truth that you possess. You're not denying the Lord and taking your candle and putting under a bushel or under a bed. But rather you take that, put it on a candlestick, and you get dressed for work. You get dressed for battle. You get dressed for war. You're ready to go. Let your loins be girt about and your lights burning. Verse 36, it says, And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. And this is the preparation that we need to make. Prepare for when the Lord comes and calls for you, when he has a duty for you, when he has something for you. Be ready to open unto him even for when he returns to take us with him. 
I don't think this gives us the opportunity to hide away. This gives us the opportunity to be prepared to go and prepared to be a shining light in this dark world. Verse 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom when the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily, I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Isn't that awesome? Look what that says. Those that when the Lord cometh, he finds them watching. He finds them on guard. He finds them prepared. He finds them faithful. When he comes and finds his disciples in that state, what is the promise? That Jesus himself will serve you. Jesus himself will say, hey, sit down here and rest a little while. Let me get girded to be your servant. Let me provide for you meat. Let me take care of your needs. And the only responsibility for the disciple was just to be watching under prayer. Just to be ready to do the Lord's will. Just to be prepared for the next thing. And if you're fearful, that's not the state that you're going to be in. You've got to have faith to be ready to act whenever God calls on you. Whenever God wants you to take that leap of faith, you've got to be prepared for those things. And the wonderful truth and promise here is, is that those that are watching will have Jesus serve them. Imagine that. We serve the Lord by preparation, by prayer, by studying, by, by preaching the gospel and doing all of these things. That's how we serve Him. But if we're found even just watching, ready, prepared, on guard for the things that are coming upon this earth, He's going to serve us in those times and care for those things. Why would He serve His servants? Because we are of more value than many sparrows. More value than the multitude. More value than... Wait for it, even just the nominal Christians that are, are not disciples, not in the word, not acting by faith. They're fearful. Jesus will be here to serve you. You've got to be faithful. You've got to be ready to do his will when he comes and knocks. Verse 38 says, And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this ye know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. And so that's, all I believe, referring to his return when he comes in the clouds, obviously. We have no idea of what the exact hour would be, so we should be ready for those things. But also just the reality that you have no idea when he cometh with just a divine appointment for you to do a great work for him. You've got no idea of when the Lord will enter in and intervene in your life. So be prepared, watching unto prayer for these things when they shall come to pass. Be ready, believer. Verse 41, it says, Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even unto all? And I believe that he had already said in, in verse 22 that he was referring to the disciples. He said in verse 1 he's referring to the disciples, but maybe a transition's happening. Maybe Jesus is kind of addressing a wider audience at this time. And so Peter's a little bit confused. Are you speaking this parable just to us, or is this kind of like a universal teaching that you're dealing with? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? So who is the faithful one, the wise one? Well, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the one that is in faith, believing, trusting God, and full of the fear of God, and a steward over all of the gifts that God has given him, all of the responsibilities that God has entrusted him with, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household. So there it is. God gives a household for you to watch over, a responsibility for you to take part in to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. He's just going to reaffirm all the things that he has said basically here with a few extra truths just directed at Peter in that question that he made. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and be drunken. Then the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in sunder and will port him a portion with the unbelievers. 
And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, to him they will ask. The more, And so therefore, our responsibilities before God and the punishment given if we don't fulfill them is always going to be dependent on how much God has given us. And I would say and hazard to say that many of us who run in our circles have heard an abundance of sound Bible teaching, have had an abundance of good godly fellowship. Here in Canada and in America, we have had freedom to assemble and of speech and of travel. We've been able to go and do great works all around the world. We have been given much. And so don't be surprised if much is required of us. Therefore, it is so much the more sin that those that have been given the abundance of freedoms to do the will of God have pulled away from doing those things. And I think that's the lesson here that God has given. He's like, this is for my disciples. This teaching is for those that have believed and have trusted, who are faithful and wise as a steward. But take heed and don't say that the Lord delayeth his coming. In other words, we're going to pull out of this thing. In a few months, it'll go away and our problems will cease. In a little while, the trouble is just going to fall away and things will go back to normal. My Lord delayeth his coming. Don't think to say something so foolish in your heart because, yeah, maybe you're not going to say that and then start beating maidservants and men servants and eating and drinking with the drunken. But in a lot of ways, aren't we doing that? Those that have said, you know, this is not the Lord's coming. There is, it's only two weeks of calm and then of, of this, this Sabbath of soul winning and Sabbath of church going, and then we'll get back to it. Well, and now it's three weeks and then four weeks. And when does it end? Those that think that it's just a little blip in time and don't think that these things are going to ramp up and get worse and worse and worse and worse, those ones that are believing that are the ones that I believe are most responsible for their actions at this time. Because they have been given much. They have been uh, offered much by way of the blessings of God. And so when they say in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. In other words, we're not in those last days. We're going to stabilize once this curve flattens. These are the ones, in my experience, that have been beating the men servants and maid servants. Well, how do you say? Well, my position is one of, this is more of an issue with an overbearing government trying to push its people around and exert its force to remove our rights. A lot of people are saying the government is doing the right thing, and therefore we should take the break and we should try to flatten out the curve, okay? But I haven't been hostile. I've, 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 I've been careful to, to not pick on people too much, except when I'm in the pulpit or when I'm reasoning with friends in, in private about such things. But the ones that are saying, the Lord delays is coming, the ones that are saying, we're going to pull through this thing, we're going to recover, things are going to get better, things are going to get easier, we're going to go back to normal, those are the ones that are vehement and angry and attacking and devouring and smiting and beating the servants of God who are simply just trying to stand in a position that they were four weeks ago instead of swaying with the ways of the world. Those are the ones that have said the Lord delayeth his coming and have begun in very minor ways to beat servants of God, men and women alike. Who knows what sins are next? Once you've given up on church, I've been preaching this for years. I've believed this for years. And once you get out of the fellowship of God, the exhortation, the encouragement, the, uh, the, the stabilizing effect that, that church has, and I've heard it from preachers who are now taking a different stance on it, who have actually closed the doors, so they've caused men to forsake the assembly. Whereby some people are like, I want to go to church, but I can't because my, my pastor has shut the doors. He's causing them to be removed from an environment that cultures righteousness where believers can watch out for one another encourage one another keep their sins in check keep you motivated to seek after god they, they've, they've pushed them away from doing those things and in the meanwhile they're beaten up on guys like me who have just decided to keep business as usual the church house open for god's people to come even if god's people don't want to come i want that door to be open because that's not an option for me 
God said, forsake not the assembly, and if I close it, I'm causing others to sin. And not just the sin of not showing up for church once, but twice, but three times. And then who knows what else they'll get into. The Bible says that those that think that the Lord is delaying his coming are going to beat on the people that don't believe that, that believe he's not delaying and he could come. He's coming. He's ready. He's going to ramp up and allow for seals to be opened so that the world's persecution can fall even more on us. But those that are of the contrary belief are eating and drinking with the drunken. Who knows what sins somebody can get into once they get out of church. And we've experienced this. We know people that were willing to sell out their families so that they could go become a superstar soul winner. That was a mindset that was not in church. We know of people that got out of church and next thing you know, they're living in fornication. And they got a baby on the way, unwed. That's... That's the mentality of people that aren't in church. And that's the reality of those that, that are, I believe, pushing this, this false ideology that, that says, hey, God's rules are dependent on what the government says. The government says, no, we, we forsake, we stop the assembly in the house of God. Unfortunately, now we think, man, I lost my place. Don't be surprised when much is required. We're all fearful of this little virus that we think China sent. Look what Jesus is sending, verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? You know, when Christ comes, I believe it's already going to be a little bit, a little bit bad in here. There's already going to be a kindle. There's already going to be a smolder when he comes to set fire on this world. He says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? So how is Christ going to be satisfied until he does this thing? So should we just think that we should be straightened, just relax, just, just live out the rest of our days? I believe times are going to get harder around here. Verse 51 says, suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on the earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two. And two against three. And I've talked to preachers who have churches like that now. Where three are against two, two against three. And there's a division. And it's all associated around with, with, with this thing. Some that have divided, decided to stay home. Some that have decided to go. Churches are dividing over these things. The father shall be divided against the son. And the son against the mother. And the mother against the daughter. And the daughter against the mother. And the, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Division is coming. This, this thing's already kindled. There's already people that are fighting and bickering over this, and it's, and it's not even a big deal yet. He, he says, Behold, I told you before. And this is why God likes to give us these, these scriptures. He says, Behold, I told you before. And he decides to tell you before so that we can be helped when these things come to pass. I have desired to tell people before. I have been preaching up here for a year and a half, and I'm looking at old sermons and clips, and they're ringing true with what's happening today. I, I would just open the Bible and tell what the Bible said. Go figure. God's able to prophesy through a guy like me. He's able to tell the future through a guy like me. But you all have Bibles. You can all discern these things. You can look at what's happening and realize the ways of the world. Verse 54, and he said also to the people, When you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, There cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be heat, and it cometh to pass. So men can look out and discern what they see, and, and, and they, they make judgments based on their surroundings and based on the ways of the world. We Christians can do more, so much better. You hypocrites, verse 56. You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Yea, and why even yourselves judge ye not what is right? Now we think we can look at this chart. We can determine the graph. We can look at the correlation of things. Man thinks that they got everything figured out. And yet... We look at that and make that our, our goal, and we don't discern the times that Scripture clearly gives indication that we could be in. 
It's a hypocr hypocritical position to discern the face of the earth and not be able to discern the times that we're living in and react accordingly. This, this, this is why I, I said this. This is a Daniel in the lion's den scenario for me. Because I discerned the times that we're living in. And I recognize that someone has tried to mandate something that God has tried to has desired to command in his believers. And so I chose God over man. That's Romans 13. That's the heart of that matter. Are desperate times coming? Yes, perhaps. But it remains that you're of more value than many sparrows. It remains that God is only giving the opportunity for these things to happen so that he can get a hold of us. He, he's letting a little bit of what's to come, tribulation, trickle through. And I've, I've been grossly disappointed about how many have buckled to that little bit of a sampling of the tribulation that is to come. God's desire is to give us the kingdom not for this world. So what does he want us to do who are of the most value unto him, who are, who are his, the apple of his eye is spiritual Israel. He wants us to watch, pray, trust, fear him above all things. And that's how we show that as the most valuable thing he has in his heart, he is valuable to us. We've got to continue in that vein. We've got to continue on and press on. Show God, hey, and God, God, I, I'm going to try to get rid of this covetousness. God, I'm going to consider what's around me, but ultimately your scripture is what I'm going to make my judgments based on. Look to him, the author and finisher of the faith. Trust in him. Don't fear those that are going to kill the body, but rather fear him, which can take that body after it's dead and cast that soul into the very pits of hell. Fear ye him. You're more value than ravens, lilies, sparrows. You're of the most and utmost value to him. Our only responsibility is to just do what he wants. Trust him, obey him, follow him, and believe on him in these last days. I think